that was when I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Life is definitely different now uh, to what it was a couple of years ago. Yeah. It's probably never been a particularly cool thing to say, but we did. We wanted to, we wanted to be a big band, a successful band. But at the same time, we obviously didn't have a clue because, you know, like on that record, the last song is an instrumental. Like, we just wouldn't, bands just didn't do that. That's the thing. All like, of why our, would you put an instrumental all on All of our favourite bands did, you know, the Stray Cats did, the Reverend Horton Heat did. You know, there were all those rockabilly bands that had those excellent kind of surf guitar instrumentals and stuff like that. So that's, that's where we were coming from. It's just great that it, that it, that it sort of crossed over. It was pretty cool going from being a, just a local muso in a band, renting and being sort of content with just living in share houses and driving a Toyota Corolla and, you know, scraping together petrol money and maybe, maybe money for a CD once a week. Going from that to then being able to quit the day job and know that you could easily pay your rent, buy a flat, buy a... TV. Do you remember your first Bentley? Go out and <laughs> go out and be able to not have to budget. My first Bentley. Yeah, I lived. I, I, lived next, I lived in McKinnon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bentley. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I remember. I yeah. remember that yeah. bit. Yeah. I don't remember my first yeah. one. They, turn, they, all, yeah. they all blur. Yeah. I just remember little things like being at a shopping centre or something, and some kid coming up, and you know, going, "Oh, you're the guy from the Living End." Like that had never happened before. You know, it had happened. If we were in Brunswick Street or if you were somewhere, you know, you'd meet other people sort of from the scene or someone had seen the band or whatever. But when you're at Southland in Cheltenham and, you know, you've got kids coming up wanting autographs and stuff, that was when I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Life is definitely different now to what it was a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I, I because I was that kid, I, I was the one going, oh, there's blah, blah, blah from the Fodes or the Fireballs <laughs> or... Mola or Pollyanna or the bands that I, I thought were sort of, they had made it. You know, they were playing the SB Gershwin Room. Yeah. And we were jealous as hell that we couldn't ever do that. So it was, it was funny that we played with those bands and then, you know, we ended up sort of touring with them and, and them supporting us and stuff. It was just weird. Well, yeah, I remember the day I was able to go to my job at the council municipal office out in Glen Waverley and say to them, I can't work anymore. The band's gonna start to pay me now, and I get to quit the quit the day job. So that was fun. But also, I don't reckon my, you know, personally, my ambitions kind of really exceeded being able to headline the Hunters Club and the Tote and the Evelyn and the Espy and venues like that. Because we, as I was saying, we sort of. As Chris was saying, we were playing gigs from 1991, 92 or whatever. But we were part of this subculture that was rockabilly and then, you know, we were sort of kind of, you know, leaned in on the, on the, on the punk scene as well. So they, these were these small but sort of thriving little scenes in Melbourne. So to be a big band within a small scene like that was a huge achievement for me. So when it was like, you know, kind of going commercial, in the charts and in the newspaper and on the radio and stuff like that, I was just like, whoa, it's completely blown my expectations and my ambitions and all of that kind of stuff. So it was just a bit of a head spin and a whirlwind and just, yeah.